We got Mr. Motherfucking Nightmare with a military horror story, military war horror story. Um, I don't, it's a lot, I know it's a lot of fucking military stories. It's a lot. I didn't hear so many. Ridiculous. Like in real life type shit. Uh, I got a couple family members that I got two uncles that was in the military. But yeah, man, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, how is y'all Wednesday going, man? Let's go ahead and get into it, though, man. <clears throat> I will be, and after this video, y'all make sure y'all go to the community and vote on the poll that I'm gonna put out for. You know what I'm saying? What I'm gonna react to tomorrow or Friday. Let's get into it. This particular story took place when I was in the Air Force and stationed in Louisiana. Louisiana, I won't huh? mention the name of the base, but I'm sure that there are many people out there who will know which one it is once I make mention of some of the details to this story. This story took place a few years after I had been stationed there. I first arrived to this base in 2006, and upon my arrival, I, along with many other new troops, were greeted with many different stories of horror. There were stories about a man in a top hat who walked a dark, long and narrow dirt road on the outskirts of a storage facility area. There was another story about a crazy man who was hit by a patrol car and ran off into the woods next to the same place. Damn. But my story relates to a separate story that was told to me. It was my second night on shift, as I recall. I was posted with an airman who had been there for several years. He gave a rundown about some little girl who had been visiting her father when the storage area we were working in was being constructed, which was well before any of our time. The story went that that little girl was playing on some of the structures while her father was working, but had fallen to her death by slipping off the edge at the top of the structure itself. Whoa. Most of the story didn't make sense to me at the God time, damn. but regardless of the facts, it still scared the shit out of me. To make matters worse, the airman had taken me to the exact place where the supposed story took place. He shut off the engine and turned off the music as we just sat there in silence. He startled me a few times, but nothing ever happened. Oh, now, skip tripping. forward about three years. I was scheduled to work that particular spot at the base this night. Keep in mind that I had been visiting this spot for years now, but at this point, the storage area had been completely closed down except for a few minor areas, which required us to do physical drive throughs and checks of this area. That's right, that's the right. shift itself started out rather shitty. Me and my Alpha, a.k.a. partner, had been given a cattle truck to do this patrol as our normal vehicle was in the shop for maintenance. Yeah, I'm not kidding. A cattle truck. I know this part doesn't seem very a whole truck? story at the moment, but it will tie into the story eventually. So to save on time, let's skip forward a few hours. We were scheduled to do three random checks of the storage facility that night, and we had already completed two of the three prior without any issues. So come about 4 o'clock in the morning, we decided to do our last check, seeing as all the maintenance guys had went home for the night in this area. The only way to access the area was with two very large separate gates, which took forever to open. We pile in, lock the gates behind us, and continue on our way. My alpha was driving during this check, and I was the spotter who used the flashlight to check the lock on each structure. But... An important detail that I left out, which may be necessary here, is that the story of the little girl had taken place on a road within the storage area, which we called Echo Street. By this point, everything was fine, and we had finished our rounds. Oh. My alpha makes the final turn down Echo Street. We had both been pretty talkative during most of the night, but we were just shooting the shit. But. I got a dangerous <coughs> feeling. Something felt different, but I couldn't make out what it was. We were about halfway down the road. I ain't gonna lie, shit like that. I ain't gonna lie. Really the whole lot. Hey. I ain't never been in the military, but I know they be having some shit going on though. And I was thinking about even working on the base one time, but as a civilian, I might still do it though. I never know. I just gotta cover up my neck tattoo. Oh, when things became almost shit. completely and frightening. Fresh lemonade. Sorry, kid, I don't get paid till Friday. Just use Bridget and get up to two hundred and fifty dollars. Completely silent. Even the rumble of our cattle truck and the faint noise of the radio playing seemed to become less audible. As we approached the structure from my previous story, I must stress at this point that even telling or typing this part still brings a chill down my spine and makes my eyes tear up in fear. But as we approached the structure itself, I turned my head to the outside of the window opposite of the structure, and out of my left ear, I hear a sound that nearly caused me to piss myself. Uh... 
It was the sound of a person groaning or moaning in distress. Sort of like the moan of the girl from the grudge. I was just finna fucking get out of my mouth. serious. The faint, creepy moan begins to nah, wait inside Kevin, Kevin they the truck between the two of us. In know. between the dark, empty... They would have had to go and shoot me by your own. I ain't gonna end up. Fuck the dumb shit. Call me when y'all at World War Three. Don't even call me then. I go to jail instead. <laughs> <laughs> Not even when brand. Blood turned cold. Dead I ass turn to my alpha and yell, dude, cut that shit out. My alpha turns to me with a confused look on his face. At this point, he begins to take his foot off the accelerator and asks, am I going too fast? I remain silent for a moment with my hand in a pausing gesture and I listen. I hear the noise again. My partner interrupts and asks, what's wrong? I quickly turn the music off without saying anything at first, and then I whisper to him, do you hear that? He stops the truck in confusion and listens closely. It was almost dead silent for a second or two when we both hear it this time. Okay, both of y'all hear it. chilling groan of a woman. It echoed in my ears. Okay, both of y'all hear it. Someone was struggling okay. to breathe and taking in a I giant breath of air while someone was trying to strangle them. Oh, yeah. The sound was beyond terrifying. The fact that I wasn't the only one hearing it only made it more of a horrifying experience. I found myself beginning to ask him my original question again. He quickly interrupts and says with a strong sound of fear in his voice, What the f*** is that? We stupidly waited to see if we could hear it again. The rumble of the gates on the back of the truck are easily heard and recognized as they made a sort of metal-on-metal -metal clatter. And the diesel engine has that typical rumble as well. But in between both the noises, we heard it again for the final time. Oh, hell no. A groan. It sounded even louder. But this time, it sounded like it was coming from both inside and outside of the truck. Like we were being surrounded by whatever was making that noise of distress. <laughs> Without even making a peep, my alpha puts the truck in drive, and he hauls our asses off that street oh, quicker than I have ever done on any other street in that entire base. He nearly flips the truck going around a curve. But it doesn't bother us one bit. But we were both in an unspoken agreement that we wanted to get out of there quickly. We got to the two gates again, and I hopped out of the truck as fast as I could. My alpha watched my back as I quickly opened both gates. He jumped back into the driver's seat, sped out, and waited for me to close both gates as well. Once we completed that task, we quickly returned to the main part of the base, and we requested to meet with our flight chief to tell him what had happened. When we finally met up with him, we expected him to think that we were both full of shit or that we had just imagined the entire thing because right. it was so late into our 12-hour shift. Oh, yeah. We were both tired. But I clearly remember him saying to the both of us, I completely believe you. As a matter of fact, I had something like that happen to me twice, once in that same place and the other in that building behind you, as he points oh. at our jailhouse. Again, I know that sounds completely cliche with that grudge-like moan we had heard. It honestly happened, and it still brings those tears of fright into my eyes every time I tell it. I went back to that storage area only once after that, but I never went down that road again, and I never went after dark. Yeah, no. Well, which one is it? <laughs> you never went, or you got down, never went up I dark. haven't told my story to many people, except for my wife and a few other of my close friends. It happened while I was stationed in the Army as a radio operator during the Vietnam War, and I haven't forgotten it to this day. I was a young recruit, freshly drafted out of high school, and I didn't know much about the war. I had no idea what I was getting into or what it was all for, yeah, no. but what I did know was that I had a duty to my fellow servicemen. Fuck it. We arrived on a Friday evening and got loaded onto many buses to be taken to our barracks. The air was very humid. The soil was soaking wet due to a storm that had just passed through the area. I vividly remember the drive and how it stunk like sewer. <sighs> My first night was uneventful and quiet, but we all felt the tense atmosphere as our drill sergeants taunted us with stories during basic training. I remember the half moon right over my head, which kept peeking out from over the clouds, and all of us were just sitting around and telling jokes. I was more of a technical guy and didn't have much aptitude for comedy, so I just listened in. My duty was to manage communications between my unit and all of our other guys so that everyone knew what was going on everywhere else. Mm -hmm. I carried a box on my back, which were the size of radio devices back then, and also a ton more equipment and supplies. In the jungle? I was quickly assigned to a tight-knit unit who had just lost their communications operator to a landmine, and I remember the first time we made contact with the enemy. Oh. It was the loudest thing I ever heard. We were in a dense part of the jungle. 
Oh uh, yeah. I think my uncle, my uncle, he he, he used to make landmines too. Type of shit, but he had got I ain't gonna say blown up, but he kind of fucked with his leg a little bit. He it didn't take it off or nothing. He nigga still all right. Nigga look like nigga look like a white Van Diesel. <laughs> no gap. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I'm talking about healthy, but it was something like that though. I know. I remember he used, he was telling me like he used to make um landmines and shit like that, which is crazy to me. But one couldn't see the enemy at all, but we quickly ducked as soon as they began firing at us, and we opened fire in their general direction in return. The chaos seemed to last forever, and we probably ceased fire after a couple of minutes. We advanced forward to close in on the enemy and secure the area, and it was the first time I ever saw the enemy up close. There they were. Three dead Viet Cong soldiers laying in a pool of their own blood. I couldn't believe that I was looking at three human beings that were alive just moments ago. Young guys who maybe had sisters or brothers and parents. Yeah. They were probably just chilling around moments before we arrived. And here we are moments later, looking at their motionless bodies. That's crazy. But I must say that I felt justified because they were the enemy. And they would have been standing over our dead bodies instead. Definitely. A few days later, got, back about that got too. assigned to a different location, which saw heavier casualties and needed more support. I'm beginning to these niggas that be want to shoot everything, kill everything. Nigga, join the army in combat. You so you want to you want to kill a motherfucker for free? Go to the army. Do something, nigga. <laughs> Just don't overkill them, though. They go to jail for a war crime. I grew accustomed to the violence, so like many of our young men died painfully. So young niggas that's watching this, go to the army. Someone wanted to speak with me. I was greeted by an older man in his late 50s who looks totally out of place. His demeanor was calculated and predictive, and even my commanding officer seemed to have turned into a yes man in front of him. He introduced himself as Frederick Douglass, an intelligence officer stationed nearby, and that I was going to be assigned to him as an RTO for his unit. I liked my unit and wanted to stay with them, but orders are orders. I had no choice, so I got on the Huey. Come on, cuz. <laughs> I asked why I don't do the ad shit. I don't skip the ad. Well, went with him. Pay for the ad. We landed in a heavily wooded area next to a few Viet Cong huts. I don't mind the show. It was heavily built up by the enemy, and I could definitely imagine the fight that must have taken place here. There were some guys who had gas masks on and others standing nearby, but they didn't seem to notice me or even care that I was there. It was a very strange atmosphere that didn't feel quite right. These guys didn't act like normal soldiers and definitely didn't have the look of fear in their eyes as most of us did. I even tried to talk with some of them, but all I got was a strange, emotionless glare like they were infected with something. Oh, Whatever shit. it was, they all had it, and it made me feel very uneasy. Oh, shit. Officer Douglas and I entered one of the smaller huts, and I was told to stay put until someone would come and get me. But, but, I should have just stayed there and waited. And I was too curious and apprehensive to relax. Well, I mean, I would have been too, though. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna lie. I wouldn't even shit. I would have been scared of shit. I would have been shitting my drawers off. Not gonna even lie to so you. So I just made my way out towards the main tent and took a peek inside. What I saw made my stomach drop like it never had before. On a makeshift table lay six murky containers. Each one of them had a severed head of a guerrilla fighter inside, with uh -huh. several tubes and wires protruded from them. Uh -huh. A green liquid seemed to be reacting with the heads, as their mouths and eyes were quivering like they were half alive. I suddenly felt a hand grab onto my shoulder. It was Intelligence Officer Douglas. He looked very upset. I meekly asked what they were doing inside there, but he angrily said that I should not have gone in there and sent me back to my hut. We must have been attacked or something. Because I woke up a day later in triage with several broken ribs and a fractured collarbone, with no memory of anything that happened right after that. I never saw Officer Frederick Douglass or those soldiers ever again during my time, if that was even his real name. And I often wonder what those guys were doing back there. Maybe they were trying to gather intelligence from dead enemy soldiers or something. Either way, it was a strange experience that I'll never forget. Shit. That is crazy. I ain't gonna lie to you. That shit is crazy. <laughs> Fuck the dumb shit. All names in the story will be changed, and all locations will be left out. This experience has left me very paranoid in a lot of ways. 
It was the late hours of the night. I could feel the thud of my heartbeat inside of my chest as our armored vehicle veered off the gravel road, plowing through the dense underbrush. Start what you're doing, like this video, and if you're new, subscribe. Five seconds. Like the video, motherfucker, and subscribe. Weird ass nigga coming over here looking at my channel name, liking the video. Y'all niggas be weird. <laughs> it had been weeks since Bravo you were silent, vanishing like a okay. wisp of smoke on a rainy plan. day. The distress call had crackled through our comms earlier, an unexpected sign of life from our long missing comrades. But what haunted me more than their sudden reemergence was the content of their message. A cryptic string of numbers repeating endlessly. Sergeant Davis, are you sure this is the place? I asked over the static hiss of the radio cutting through the silence that had settled over our squad. That's what command confirmed. Get ready, Davis replied. As our vehicle came to a halt, the dense fog seemed to get worse. We disembarked into the unknown, the silence of the abandoned hey, the music was me right. settling. Buildings stood like hollowed out husks, with windows shattered, doors ajar, a living town not even a few weeks ago, now just a ghost town. Davis ordered us in a whisper to stay sharp as we moved forward, our boots crunching on broken glass and debris. The signs of a struggle were everywhere. Overturned furniture, bloody yeah. rags, and oh. scattered ammunition littered the ground, painting yeah, a picture man. of the chaos that had taken place here recently. The base, once a bustling hub of military activity, was eerily silent now, except for our own shallow breaths and the distant, echoing cry of the numbers broadcast. As we neared the command center, the transmission grew louder, a constant chant that seemed to bore into my mind, its meaning as elusive as the shadows in the fog surrounding us. Entering the command center, we found it abandoned, the air stale, the only light coming from the blinking consoles. The radio speakers, crackling with static, repeated the sequence over and over in a monotone voice. Five, eight, two, four, seven. Five, eight, two. Four, seven. Corporal Lee. Why that sound like Nightmare Files? Don't they be working together if I ain't tripping? Mr. Nightmare and Nightmare Files or I'm tripping? I don't know. It, it was somebody he used to do a collab with back in the day. I think it was Nightmare Files, though. I ain't gonna count. Either him, Whispered Diaries, or... I think that's it. Or Blue Spooky. It won, um, that he, Mr. Nightmare used to do uh, collabs with. Like, one to tell the story, and then the other one will go, like, I like that, too. I like when they do that shit, like, collab shit. That shit be hard. Like, I to what them, does like, it mean? I saw her eyes were wide as she scanned the room. Commander Haskins might have known, Davis said. Commander Haskins was the name of the unit's leader who had vanished along with his team. We continued our search through the desolate base, hoping to find a clue, a survivor, work. anything. But it was the laboratory that changed everything. The door was ajar, hanging off its hinges as if forced open. Inside, the air was thick with the scent of decay and chemicals. Shattered vials and overturned equipment were signs of activity halted abruptly. And then we saw them. Bodies. Members of Bravo unit, or what was left of them, were sprawled across the floor. Excuse me? Their faces contorted in expressions of terror. What the f It was a massacre. But the cause was unclear. No bullet wounds, no signs of struggle on their remains. And then, Lee gestured toward a corner of the room. There, amidst the pile of research notes and hastily abandoned experiments, lay the body of Commander Haskins. Clutched in a stiff, lifeless hand was a notepad. The numbers 58247 scrolled across it in shaky handwriting, followed by a single, chilling sentence. They're coming for us. The revelation struck us like a physical blow, the implications of his words spiraling into a million questions with no answers. Oh, hell Who was coming hell. for them? Was this distress call not a beacon of hope, but a warning? It was then that you better get the fuck up out of there. The reality of our situation descended upon us. The isolation, the eerie silence broken only by that relentless string of numbers. We were not the rescuers, we were the next victims. Panic set in as the base seemed to close in on us. The fog outside felt like it was thickening. Our own... No TV in your room. Don't worry. This application will help you turn your smartphone uh, into a projector. The choice was to flee. We ripped... 
That mean the more ass y'all gonna get on this video. Every time they do that bullshit. <laughs> Stumbling through the fog. I got you I paid too. Distant light of our vehicle. The numbers continue to echo in my mind. A chant that seemed to follow us, whispering through the fog. Just as the vehicle came into view, a shadow emerged from the mist. A chill colder than death itself crawled up my spine as the strange man cloaked in shadow moved towards us. We need to go now. Davis's shout snapped me back to reality, the urgency in his voice mirroring a primal fear within me. Our training had prepared us for many different types of enemies, but we had no idea what we were dealing with here. We scrambled into the vehicle. Lee's hands were shaking as she manned the communications with obvious fear and shaking in her voice. This is Alpha Unit calling command. Mayday, mayday. We need immediate extraction from Zone Bravo. You copy. Over. The radio crackled. The numbers interrupting her plea for help. Five, eight, two, four, seven. Oh, hell no. I couldn't shake the feeling that those numbers held some kind no, of sir. meaning to what we had stumbled into. No, sir. As the base faded into the distance, swallowed by the fog, so too did the person who emerged from the shadows of the fog. Yet the terror it inspired lingered as we raced toward an uncertain future. Well, I would have been left. Davis broke the silence and said, we can't let this end here. We need to find out what those numbers mean and what happened to Bravo Unit. Fuck it. I wanted nothing more than to find these things out as well. I felt like we owed it to them, thinking of the twisted, lifeless bodies we'd left behind. Yeah. As the first light of dawn began to pierce the darkness, true that, I felt true a that. grim determination settle over me. We had survived the night, but the real battle felt like it was just beginning. Armed with nothing but a string of numbers and the haunting memories of what we had witnessed, the mystery of those numbers and the horrors of what could have happened to Bravo Unit still remain a mystery, and it stays with me, haunting me. Yeah, I know, that's sure it stays with everyone that's from my unit. The horrors at that base were just a chapter in a story far greater and more terrifying than any of us could have imagined. Yeah, I know that shit was hard. I know that shit was hunting. I'm not going to even lie to you. Um, like I said the other day, uh, make sure y'all go watch my previous Mr. Ballin video and my other previous video, three videos before this one. But I don't think I, I only said it in one. But when we get the 5,500, 5,500 on this channel, but it's 5,500. <laughs> Some of y'all motherfuckers that don't know out there. Five, because I'm at 5,300 right now subscribers. You know what I'm saying? When we get to uh, 5,500, I'm going to do a giveaway. A $50 giveaway. You feel me? I get my YouTube money and all that shit. I get my YouTube checks and all that shit. You feel me? All that shit coming in and I'll be getting paid. I got a lot of more shit coming in. But like I was saying, like, I'm going to give y'all a $50 giveaway. I'm doing fifty dollar giveaways. I ain't never did a fifty dollar get. The most I done gave out was thirty, to uh, twenty and thirty. You feel me? And that's just all uh, you feel me. Just hitting a mark. You feel me? Or just doing it out of kindness. I'm doing a fifty dollar giveaway. So that being said, let's go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Discuss all the stories and shit. The first story, that shit was crazy. I ain't gonna lie. The second one, uh, I ain't gonna lie. It, I mean, the first one, like the first one, it, I ain't gonna lie, it's a, it's a couple places that really is truly hunted, like we'll be thinking some shit and hunted, but meantime, they did run off 12 hours of sleep, so they wasn't probably remember shit, I ain't gonna even lie to you, the second story, it was on some other shit, and this story was same thing or uh, finding dead bodies and shit after somebody did something to them and the other one there was a spearman shit back in the day i know they the military be doing some some some, some crazy shit that y'all don't even believe but they do let's make it that would make it more crazier not gonna lie to y'all <laughs> but this whole video was crazy mr nightmare you did your thing that being said see y'all when i see y'all let's ride motherfucker.